This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And I want to give a special thank you to Shane Sawyer, who just increased his pledge amount. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so now let's get to our show. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 475 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Tom Gerenser, making his 19th appearance on the show. He's the author of the business book Think Like Google and the short story collection Intergalactic Refrigerator Repairman Seldom Carry Cash. And his popular science book How It's Made, written for the Discovery Channel, will be out in December. And we'll be speaking with him today about his favorite short story writer Robert Sheckley, with a special focus on the book Store of the Worlds, The Stories of Robert Sheckley, edited by Jonathan Lethem and Alex Abramovich. And now here's our interview with Tom Gerenser. All right, so we're here with Tom Gerenser. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Okay, so the first thing I want to mention is that Tom appeared on the show two weeks ago to talk about a short story collection, Intergalactic Refrigerator Repairman, Seldom Carry Cash. So, Tom, what's been going on with that? Oh, uh, I was so, I'm so grateful. I sold over 400 copies now so far since, since I was on. So clearly, uh, the listenership is uh, is very engaged, and I really appreciate. Thank you to everyone who bought a copy. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, I was totally blown away by those numbers. I mean, that's like twenty or thirty times what I would have guessed. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't expect that either. I was just, I thought something would happen, but I was just completely blown away. So, thank you very much for having me on to talk about it, and thank you to everybody who bought one. Yeah, and it was kind of an interesting experiment because this was a self-published uh, book and you hadn't done any, you hadn't really mentioned it anywhere until you appeared on the podcast. So it was kind of a clean experiment to see what the impact of doing a podcast appearance would be. And uh, and yeah, it was really encouraging. I, uh, you know, because obviously the reason I do this podcast is I want to get attention for authors and I hope everyone that comes on, you know, that they see some real benefit from appearing on the show. And so, uh, yeah, I'm feeling very, uh, very encouraged by uh, just the idea that, yeah, just from one appearance on this podcast, you could sell, yeah, hundreds of uh, hundreds of books. You should be very, very proud of what you've done because I, I've been on lots of podcasts for other books in other, you know, nonfiction books and whatnot. And uh, I might sell two or three copies after a podcast appearance, but nothing like that. That was completely mind blowing. Yeah. And so, uh, so 400 copies, that's like a few thousand dollars profit, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Which you were saying, right, is not bad for one hour's work. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm. I'm. I'm completely blown away. I hope everybody enjoys it who bought it. I hope it's. I hope it's worthwhile for you. It was worth your money. Uh, and, and yeah, I, definitely not bad for an hour or two's work. And so yeah, and so copies are still available. I mean, it's an ebook, so but uh, you know, copies are still available, and um, you know, like. You know, there's so many authors, if you buy a book, they're never going to know or care that you bought it, you know, like big time authors. But here, Tom and I are paying attention to every single sale and, you know, and uh, celebrating. So, uh, you know, if you want to make us happy, go pick up uh, Intergalactic Refrigerator Repairman Seldom Carry Cash by Tom Grenzer. Yeah, thank you so much. I don't want this to turn into a, you know, an NPR fundathon or anything. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we can move on. But I, I really so much appreciate it. I'm so grateful. Yeah. Um, all right, cool. So let's move on to our main topic for today, which is Tom's favorite short story writer, Robert Sheckley. Um, so Tom, how did you first discover Robert Sheckley? It was when I was a kid, actually. Uh, I uh, The way I originally discovered him was uh, NPR. We were just, I just mentioned <laughs> NPR. <laughs> they uh, had a, a show called X Minus One, which was... Um, I think they didn't have the show. I think it was originally an old radio show from the back in the days, you know, when there were radio dramas on the radio in like the 50s and whatnot. And there were some great old time radio comedians and ra old time radio shows that 
persisted right up into the 60, early 60s, I think. And then it started to die away because TV got a lot more popular. But um, but yeah, th- there was a, the show X-1 was one of those shows. And it was fantastic old time radio stuff, which I just loved. Because it was so, you couldn't see anything, but you could hear everything. And it was so, it was at such the height of its art form. And Robert Sheckley was a, a frequent contributor to some of those. Um, and they would, I don't know, I think they would, what they would do is dramatize his stories, kind of like uh, uh, Love, Death, is it Sex, Death, and Robots, the show that love, we've... Love, Death, and Robots. Oh, pardon me. <laughs> I got a little uh, oh, a little out of control there. But yeah, <laughs> Love, Death, and Robots, kind of like that, the way they just find cool stories. And then they say, hey, we're going to dramatize this for Netflix. Well, they were doing that back then for radio. And there was one, and I can't remember the name of it but it was um it was really cool it was this story it's not in the collection but it was a story about this uh alien and he's writing letters to this other alien that he's he's corresponding with and he's talking about how he's um he's on this he's on earth and he's trying to study the terrans and then it switches back and forth between his letters and then narration third person narration of one of the earth people who's like these two guys are up in this hunting cabin together. And this one, uh, finds this teleport device that the creature is using. And he thinks it's some kind of new like trap. Cause he's a hunter and it goes back and forth. It's such a clever story. I won't, I won't try to tell the whole plot, but it's so fun and funny. And I remember hearing it and just being completely blown away by it. I think when I was like, I don't know, like 13 or 14 or something, and um and years later reading that in an anthology and being like that was a Sheckley story I had no <laughs> idea. And then the the second way I came across his work was um uh, Douglas Adams I'm a big fan of Douglas Adams as you know and him as well I discovered him through first through NPR through listening to Hitchhiker's Guide on there or actually I had listened to it on there I can't remember Chicken and Egg my mom got me a copy of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy I think that came first but then uh, but then in the course of being becoming a fan of Douglas Adams, I um, I read uh, some interview snippets with him. I think it was the Neil Gaiman book uh, called Don't Panic, which is a is kind of has some interviews with Douglas Adams in it. But in there, he asks uh, Douglas Adams about Robert Sheckley and, you know, this controversy about, you know, people say you've copied Robert Sheckley and Douglas Adams is like, well, you know, I had never read his stuff. But when I did, I was like, wow, it's really similar to my stuff. And so I was like, oh, really similar to Douglas Adams? Let's check it out. So then I went, I used to go into old bookstores all the time and just look in the science fiction section. And I found, um, I found a Robert Sheckley, you know, anthology of his short stories and loved it. And then was always on the lookout for more ever since. Well, yeah, actually, um, and those X minus one episodes that you mentioned, a lot of those are available as podcasts. I've, I've listened to a bunch of them. I'm not sure what you could find right now, but, um, you know, those are still available and they're really good. Like in a recent episode, we mentioned the lifeboat mutiny and that was one. I'm, I'm almost certain I listened to it as an X minus one episode. Oh, cool. Um, and I, I've let this slide in the past, but I know some listeners are complaining that it's, it's Neil Gaiman, not Neil Gaiman. So, uh, pardon me. I, I never know. I, I think I've said, I've said it different ways, but okay. So Neil Gaiman gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's cool. And then, yeah, so yeah. And you talked to, I guess I'll also, also mention. So you, we, we, we both just read this book, this uh, collection of Sheckley stories called store of the world, the stories of Robert Sheckley edited by Jonathan Lethem and Alex Abramovich. And you also um, wrote an afterword for a, a Sheckley book called Dimensions of Sheckley that had a couple of like three or four of his novels in it. And so in, in your afterword there, which I just read, you, you talked about how you discovered him. And, you know, you told this story about how you, um, you read this, this Douglas Adams interview where the interviewer had said, like, did you, um, you know, were you inspired by this Robert Sheckley book? Dimension of Miracles. Could you talk about that? Because I've never read, I've never read Dimension of Miracles. Yeah, so it's been a while since I've read it myself. Um, but you know, Sheckley has this reputation for being this absolutely brilliant master of the short story, and then unfairly, I think. Although I used to think I used to agree with this uh, until I read a couple of his much better books, but unfairly has a reputation for just never quite figuring out the novel. 
And um, Dimension of Miracles is one of those. It's not, I don't think it's anywhere near, near as good as Hitchhiker's Guide, but it's certainly has, um, you know, it has this, uh, this one character in it who, uh, it, it's about this guy who goes from, from world to world. And one of the places he goes is to this, this place where they build planets and there's a such a there's this really funny scene where this executive who's in charge of building planets is um is like he's like the typical executive he's really busy he doesn't have time for anything and uh this guy who's like trying to help the main character of the novel he's saying oh you got to impress your humanity on him and and the guy the main character says of course of course and he goes no no i mean you really have to impress that you're actually a human because otherwise he's just going to he's just going to like have you killed He's not going to understand who that, you know, it's not that you have to impress your humanity to impress him. You, you have to show him you're human or you're going to wind up dead. And, uh, and so that almost happens. The guy, the guy's like, you know, he's, he's walks up to the CEO and he says, you know, can you help me? I'm trying to get home and blah, blah, blah. And, and it turns out that this guy originally made the earth. And so he's trying to, he's asking this guy, can you help me get back to earth? And, uh, the CEO, rather than listen to him says, uh, Hey, what's this, what's this? human doing here can somebody just like stick him back in the protoplasm vat with the cows <laughs> and he's like no 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 I, i'm not part of your creation I, i'm here from like you know i came from a, a long journey and he's like tries to he has to try to convince him and, and he has like no luck at all he doesn't end up dying but it, it's anyway it's a really it's it's a fun book i do recommend it but it's not one of sheckley's best he does have a couple of books that i found later i've read probably six or seven of his books. And a lot of them are just kind of like stream of consciousness, almost like a fever dream, a lot of funny stuff, but nothing really to hold it together. Um, but there are a couple really notable exceptions that aren't that funny, but are very good novels. Um, one of them being um, uh, The Status Civilization, which is a very kind of prisoner, you know, the prisoner-esque sort of story. Um, and then another one, I think it's called Zolotl, X-L-O-T-L. I think that's the name of it. It's basically about this like space tick that gets on a, on someone's leg and comes home to Earth and, and tries to take over the planet. Uh, and that one is also excellent, very much like The Thing or, uh, or that kind of, um, you know, that kind of aesthetic. What, what do you make, though, of this idea that, I mean, because because people often say that, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide was inspired by it's mentioned in Miracles and, and Douglas Adams says he never read it. Um, but kind of what what's your take on that? I suspect in my heart of hearts, although I have no I would be perfectly happy to be proven wrong about this, but I suspect that he did read Sheckley just because of something in Neil Gaiman's uh and I love Neil Gaiman by the way. I'm so sorry I get his name wrong so often, but he <laughs> he he um you know that's the problem when you just mostly read and you don't talk to anyone <laughs> you learn the pronunciations <laughs> of things wrong so i gotta listen to more podcasts exactly pronounce all these authors names exactly so no i i strongly suspect he did just because i think it's in that gaiman book uh don't panic where douglas adams tells a story about how he was he had this writing partner so he started it out as a you know he was in bbc light entertainment and he was doing radio comedy and he had this idea for this radio play and it turned it out to be hitchhiker's guide and he was writing it with a friend of his and the friend wrote like 30% and he wrote like 70%. And when he wanted to do a book, the friend said, I'll write it with you. And he said, no, 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 I want to do it myself. Uh, it was my idea. And, you know, I appreciate the offer, but I kind of want this to be my book. And so he cut out all the stuff from the radio play that his friend had thought up. And he wrote all of it from scratch. And he showed it to his friend and he said, what do you think? I think I'm getting this right, but it's been, you know, decades since I wrote, since I read Don't Panic. Um, but so the friend said, you know, I think it reads a lot like Vonnegut. And I think at the time, Adams was a huge fan of Vonnegut. So it was coming out like Vonnegut. And I think he was frustrated by that. So he's like, well, I don't want it to come out like Vonnegut. And then in the interview, Adams then says, so I went away and, you know, I, I did some thinking and I came back and I started writing it. It started to come out good. And I thought I, I always kind of that always kind of makes me think he went away and then he discovered Sheckley. <laughs> and then because it didn't come out like Vonnegut anymore, it came out good. Uh, but I kind of wonder if he didn't appropriate Sheckley's voice somewhat, which I don't fault him. I mean, it's a great voice and I, I don't fault him for it. And I, you know, wonder if I'm guilty of that myself. I think less so as I age, but, um, but, I, but I do think, you know, I do think that, that, he probably did read some Sheckley. I don't think 
you know, who cares if he took the idea of someone who made the earth? I don't really care about that part. That part of the Magrathea part is nothing like Dimension of Miracles, it, except for there's an idea of somebody who made the earth. That's it. So it's and it's not apart from that. It's totally different. I'm, I don't I don't I don't really care if he, you know, who he got that idea from Sheckley or he didn't. He might have read some Sheckley short stories. I don't know. But I do really think he read Sheckley before he started uh, started writing. Well, you know, Tom, because I went back and listened to your interview from two weeks ago and you were telling the story about how this editor was like, oh, my God, you obviously read this baby story, you know. Yeah. And you hadn't. So it, it might be just something like that, too. Well, it's not like, again, it's not the idea that makes me think he got this idea. It's the voice. It's the voice is so similar to Sheckley that makes me think uh, he probably read some Sheckley and really liked that voice. Um, it's you know, and it's not it's not the same as the, the childproof story I told you about where it's not it, it, that was the idea. She was like, oh, it's the same idea. Um, ideas, as, as we pointed out, are a dime a dozen. The same idea pops up so many times in science fiction that you can't re- nobody can really claim an idea. But uh, I do think Sheckley, though, a lot of his ideas popped up in the 50s. And then you see other novels popping up in the 70s and 80s on the same ideas. I do kind of wonder, you know, the running man um, is very similar to, I'm not sure if it's the prize of peril or there's another story. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's the, I haven't read it, but that's what everyone says. Prize of peril. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So I, I don't think it's, it's not ideas so much as voice in this case. Uh, uh-huh. and so you actually interacted with Robert Shackley, right? So tell us about that. Yeah. So, um, being a naive writer looking for any kind of way to improve myself, I, I, I had gone and and interviewed uh, Douglas Adams overseas and talked to him for a while. But long before I did that, in uh, before I went to Clarion in nineteen, I think it was nineteen ninety eight. I just was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if this guy's still around because I know his stories were written in the fifties and sixties and so on. But I want to see if he's still around. So I Googled Robert Sheckley email address and an, <laughs> and, an, and an email address popped up, an AOL dot com address. So I emailed him and I was like, Hey, I don't know if you if you're going to get this, but I just want to tell you, I really love your work and blah, 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 blah. And he emailed me back within like a day or so. He emailed me back. He was like, oh, it's so kind of you. I'm so glad. And I remember distinctly, he said, look, you know, I've written some nice things and some people have said some nice things about me for it. And beyond that, I don't know if I could ever do it again. I don't know why I ever did it, how I ever did it. I just don't know. So, you know, kind of like, don't put me on a pedestal. I'm just this normal human being who blundered into this and, and it worked somehow for a while and I don't understand why or how and I can't do it anymore. And, um, you know, it, he was he was such a kind, gracious man and I just, I struck up a conversation with him that lasted for years and turned into, I, I asked him, you know, hey, could we ever collaborate on a short story? And he said, yes, he'd be happy to. And that, it grew and grew and grew. We went back and forth with notes and it, it became a novel and uh, at some point, it became kind of overwhelming for both of us. I think it was too daunting uh, for me. And it was too, for him, it was too, um, I, I just don't know if I was a good enough writer. And I also, I think he had a crisis of faith about himself where he was thinking, I don't know if I can make this work. And um, we, we just sort of fell away from it. And then tragically, and I think it was 2005, he died uh, of heart trouble when he was over in Russia. And it was, it was very sad. Um, but both for me, but also for his family, you know, he's got this, um, feel free to stop me if I'm, if I'm going on. Too no, long no, go, go. Just... He, he's got this reputation, which, which was kind of bolstered for me by Mike Resnick, who I also became friendly with, uh, through Clarion. But he, um, Sheckley has this reputation for, you know, he's a, he was a great writer, but he kind of couldn't get out of his own way, especially as he aged. And, um, he had some, some issues with, according to, I think it was according to Mike Resnick with depression that forced it, that made it, made him have a lot of writer's block. And, um, and that, that is kind of the sense that people get of him, but that is not the sense I got of this man at all through corresponding with him. He was, he was so open to just talking to me like this, nobody who just like liked him and answering my questions about writing and about his work. Uh, he, he very rarely had an, had an answer about his work because he couldn't remember. You know, he'd say, I don't know. I'd have to go back and reread that. And I really don't want to. I don't, I don't know what I was thinking when I wrote that. And I, I'm sure it was, you know, profound. But I just he's like to me, it was almost like uh, 
like a dream where I would get in this dream state and write and I don't really, after, even 10 minutes later, I wouldn't know how I did it. So uh, just an amazing man, amazing talent, but also just an amazing, uh, amazingly kind, gracious person who, who to me always seemed to be very happy. And his wife, um, you know, even out, she friended me on Facebook after he died. And I think because of that afterward for Dimensions of Sheckley that you mentioned, and uh, she, he described her, you know, that he was, he would tell me about her and say, I'm just so in love. And, um, you know, I, you get this idea from his work that he's this lovelorn person who's always going through all these failed relationships. And I think there was some truth to that in his life. I'm not sure, but certainly. Yeah. Well, he was married, married five times. Okay. So yeah, clearly, but certainly toward the end of his life, I mean, all he talked about with Gail was that, you know, I'm, I'm just so in love and, you know, he'd tell me about, oh, Gail and I are going on a trip to Venice and I'm so excited and we're going to have so much fun. And then he would tell me how much fun it was after. And so uh, certainly a happy ending for that man in, in terms of that. Yeah. So he um, what do you make of this idea that he sort of declined, that his his writing declined over the decades? Because in this book that we both just read, um, Store of the Worlds. There are 26 stories in the book, and 21 of them are from the 50s, four are from the 60s, one is from the 70s, and then nothing after that. Um, what do you make of that? Do you, do you think that that's like, do you agree with that distribution of if you were editing the anthology? Yeah, I mean, there's a Metallica documentary that I watched that just convinced me that of the of the difficulty of having the creative mind age gracefully. And I think I worry about that with myself. I'm 52, but I, but it's crazy to think that way because even when I, even when I was young and writing things that I look back on now that I say, that's good. I was convinced I was no good. So I can't, I mean, I can't, and I know he says the same thing. I've actually read um, interviews and, and nonfiction pieces by him where he says the same thing. Like he's always convinced he's no good. Um, but except in retrospect, he's like, well, that story was good, but I'm no good now. Um, that was always kind of his sense. But I did get the sense just from reading his later stuff. He sent me one book of his called Options that he wrote around the time we were corresponding or he published. And I, I was rooting for it all the way through. But the whole way through, I had this kind of feeling of like, is this good or is this not good? I wasn't like, wow, this is so good. But I was there were parts of it that I thought were great. And then I shared it with a, um, with this German, uh, uh, this woman who ran a school in Argentina. She was this German expatriate in Argentina who ran an, uh, English as a second language school. And she read it. And, she, and I, I remember asking her like a month later, oh, did you read that book I, I lent you? And she said, yes. And I said, what'd you think of it? And she said, well, you know, I, I got about halfway through and I said, well, this is postmodernist trash. And, uh, I, I I really, that did not endear me to her. I, I had a hard time liking her as much after that, but I kind of was like, oh, maybe it isn't good. You know, maybe he did. I, it's one of those things where I was just rooting for him, but I never did except for one story called The Day The, Day the Aliens Came, which I thought was very funny and very similar to his early work. But I don't think it was that he couldn't do that kind of stuff later. I just think it was that he didn't want to. He found that kind of frivolous and he wanted to write about things that mattered to, you know, a 70 plus year old man, which aren't the same things that matter to a 20 something or a 30 something year old man. And the, and those things, unfortunately, aren't the things that a science fiction readership is going to care about as much. I, I just think it's that more than anything. I think he he was writing for an older audience. And, and um, I think that, you know, he didn't want to do that that funny, silly stuff anymore, which, which, why would he, I think he actually expressed that to me, like, and the, and the story we were working on, I wanted to write humor and he absolutely didn't. He's like, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that now. I want to write this other, it was a cool idea, but it just wasn't humor and he didn't want it to be humor. And I think when I started trying to write humor into it, he, that was one of the things that kind of pushed him away from it. So that's interesting because you would look at that distribution, right? 21 story, 21 of his best stories in the 50s and think like, oh, he peaked in the 50s and then he had a couple of things that uh, after that. But the actually the stories from the 60s and 70s, I think, are the best stories. You know, I, I sent you my uh, my ranking of all the stories and uh, my four favorites by, by a pretty wide margin are Can You Feel Anything When I Do This, 1969, Is That What People Do, 1978. 
The Language of Love, 1957. That's the one from the 50s. And then Shall We Have a Little Talk, 1965. So it, it's like he was continuing to grow and evolve into the 60s and 70s. It was just like, I don't know. Um, I don't know what the other stories that he wrote around then were like, or maybe he wasn't writing that many stories anymore. But uh, he was clearly continuing to develop, um, you know, at least up till 1978. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think he was getting better and better. And it's, and it's funny that you mention um, that you mention can I can you feel anything when I do this? That is probably one of if not the most fav my most favorite uh, science fiction short story ever. It's just such a great it's such a great story. It's definitely you can you can tell it was written for Playboy, because it's got some of that, you know, not woke sort of angle to it. But it also it also is just such a perfect story where it works on the level of the jokes. It works on a deeper level where you see that it's about this woman who's um, got a real story problem that is very deftly and quickly trotted out near the beginning. And she's got this huge like desire and goal. And then coupled with this science fiction idea, and then near the end, you get this massive shot of emotion in the final sentence. It's just it's an amazing story. Yeah, yeah, and it's really heartbreaking at the end. And I guess one thing I was observing is that maybe if he had written more stories whose titles ended in question marks, he would have had more <laughs> success. Because, like, yeah, yeah, certainly. Uh, what was the other one you mentioned that I also absolutely love? Um, is that uh, what, is that what people do? Yes, yeah, such a brilliant story. Again, again, such a brilliant story. It's funny because his best stories, like they point the finger at the main character and then they point the finger at someone else in the story. And then they point the finger at the reader, which is so cool. And you know, like, uh, um, can you feel anything when I do this at the end, you kind of get the sense that it's maybe it's Frank's story and maybe it's Sheckley's story. Maybe it's like him responding to a bad breakup and saying, look, this is not my fault. Um, and then with, can you feel anything when I do this? You know, you, you kind of at the end, it's this brilliant. Do you want to talk about the, plot of the story at all yeah yeah so um so the story is there's a, there's a housewife and she had, we, we are told that she does not have a great relationship with her husband and a box arrives is delivered to her house and she opens it up and there's this ai vacuum cleaner in it and she's like who would send me this i already have an ai vacuum cleaner i don't need another one and and he's and the vacuum cleaner says, oh, no, but I'm this great new vacuum cleaner. Look, I can like massage you and all this stuff. And he starts massaging her and it gets more and more sexual. And then um, eventually the uh, vacuum cleaner confesses that he had seen her in a department store weeks before and fallen in love with her and had himself delivered to her. And uh, and it kind of goes from there. But, yeah, that's the that's the premise of the story. But so so I love how uh, at the end he. um you know, it turns out the, the the husband is in the other room, like on some kind of barbiturates. And uh, at the end, do you want me to talk about the end or should I not do spoilers? Because it's a pretty damn good story. I hate to ruin it for people. Yeah. Why don't you not spoil yeah. that one? Let's not do that. Let's move on to um, can you feel anything when I do this? I feel like at the end of that. No, we have been talking about. Oh, can pardon me. I, I meant to say, uh, uh, is that what people do? At the end of is that what people do? you get the sense that you got to point those magic binoculars back at yourself um, because you're the ones, <laughs> you know, it, it's so cool how the story is about, you do this better than I do. So why don't you sum that story up real quick? Yeah. So it's about a guy and he um, uh, gets binoculars so he can spy on the girls changing in the window of the building across the street and ends up with these weird army experimental army surplus binoculars that allow that have like basically magical properties and allow him to see what's going on in all sorts of different rooms in this building and he sees that there are things that are happening in these secret rooms that that you know are that he never imagined that we never imagined and um and that there's just this there's, there's all these things that people do that you know, are you know are just not talked about ever publicly and you would never know them uh, unless you had magical binoculars yeah. So, so again, at the end, I feel like it turns, he turns it, he kind of makes you examine yourself and be like, well, what are you doing right now? You know, what are you, what do you think you're doing? That's so that you're, you're this voyeur looking into this story. And, uh, same way where at the end of, um, 
can you feel anything when I do this, that it kind of makes you examine yourself. I think those are his best stories. And those are, those are among the four that you mentioned are definitely, there's a lot of self-examination that the reader is challenged to do at the end, which, which is so refreshing at, you know, it's a, they're all really, most of them are really funny or at the very least based on a really funny concept, but handled very seriously. They're not all funny stories, but, but some, most of his stories are very funny, but they're also not just funny. They're, they're very, a lot of, some of them, one of the, the, uh, besides still waters, I mean, I rereading that one, I, I choked up, I choked up reading the end of that. And I, and I, um, it's such a silly idea, sort of, on the surface, but he, he taps into this deep emotional well with with his best stories. Yeah, and I mean, that was one thing that was really striking me reading through all these stories, most of which I'd never read before, was that there's always something interesting. You know, there's always, some, you know, n- none of these stories are just like action adventure stories, uh, I guess, with maybe the possible except maybe one or two possible exceptions, like the, the, the Windy Planet one, which I actually, I actually liked a lot. But I mean, um, you know, there's always like some really inventive, clever, original thing uh, in all these stories. And so I, I really found this a really enjoyable book to read. I was never bored reading this at all. Um, and he's just really, yeah, he's, he's a good, good stylist. I mean, you could tell he was selling stories to, you know, the slick magazines like Playboy. Um, if people don't know, I mean, Playboy, um, I don't know if it still is, but, but for, for decades was a very high end market for fiction stuff like Fahrenheit 451 was originally published in Playboy. Um, and so it wasn't all like, you know, sexual, um, the, the, the fiction they were publishing, um, but yeah, I mean, you could, you could definitely see why he had so much success as a magazine writer, because he writes these stories that are really engaging right off the bat. And that, um, you know, would appeal, I think, to most people, you know, even if you're not like a hardcore science fiction fan, I think a lot of these stories would, would be pretty engaging to you. And, and they're so, they're such classics too, in the sense you can read them, you can read them today. And a lot of them, maybe some of the ideas maybe even work better today because there are these concepts of like you know oh it's the future earth and we're running out of room for people to to buy a house or something and that's becoming a real problem and uh you think oh you know that's that's kind of funny because that would never happen but back in the 50s you would think that um and today though it's 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 far less funny it's it's more like a lot of his ideas are just so prescient where where uh did i pronounce that one right i feel like yeah yeah (laughs) (laughs) where uh he he takes he takes something that we're still worried about or we're worried about even more now like he was he was just extrapolating from basically i think looking at problems and saying well that keeps going in that direction in another 50 years it's going to be like this you know, and you look at it and say, "Yep, yeah, no, we've gone closer to that now. Like we, it's worse that way now. And uh, so I, I think there's such classics in that sense and that he also gets into the human heart so well. And the other thing that's so amazing about Sheckley is this, this, this collection has some of his best stories in it, some of the ones that are my absolute favorites. But if you go on Amazon and Google his name and look for his short stories, you will find lots and lots and lots of anthology of, of collections rather uh with his short story of his short stories that you'll read through and most of the short stories are as good as the ones in this although this one is pretty good like i got to admit they did a uh, latham and uh Ab- abramovich is that right i think so um did a did a great job picking these 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 are among my my absolute favorite sheckley stories but there are still there are so many others that I think are are amazing. There's one called Fishing Season, um, where people start disappearing in this town, and there's this old grandfather who's always goes out fishing every day, and then the people in the town are like, "What's going on? Why is everybody disappearing?" And then they start noticing that like the milk is like has like one letter incorrect on the jug, or like something's wrong with the bread. It says you know, it spells bread, B-R-E-D, <laughs> or like, <laughs> there's just these things that are wrong. And then this guy like, keeps watching his father, you know, leaving the house and going out fishing. And this guy is like, you know, he's like a grown, he's a, like, it's 30 something year old man whose father lives with them. He's an older guy who just fishes all the time, retiree. And uh, finally, near the end, he realizes like, these are alien fishing lures. 
that's where everybody's going. And th- so there's that one. And then there's, there's one called one man's poison that I wish they had included where these two guys are uh, marooned on this alien planet and they find a cache left by another spacefaring civilization on the planet of supplies and they're starving and they only have had like one ship's radish between them over the past like week or something. So they're starving to death and they find all this alien food, but they have to figure out like, well, we can't, it's alien food. We can't eat it. Right. So they start testing all this different stuff and it does all this crazy stuff. Like one of the uh, food items like giggles when you touch it. And this guy's like, I am not eating something that giggles. And, uh, but apparently these aliens, like they love that. So, uh, they, they, their problem is how do we find something that's food? And then that's a brilliantly written st- Again, you know, I tried to describe, uh, can you feel anything when I do this to you a couple of weeks ago on, on a podcast, Dave, and I didn't do it justice. I'm not doing that one justice either, but trust me, it's a brilliant, brilliant story. <laughs> and there are so many other, there's a whole list of, um, eight of the triple a ACE interplanetary decontamination service stories. There's a whole series an eight series eight story series of those that are all so much fun uh, where these two guys, they're like detectives, but they go to planets and find out what's wrong with the planet and try to like fix it so that people can live there. And, uh, and they're just such good characters and so much fun to read. So, so he's, he, he, and I've read somewhere he's written over 400 stories and I feel like I've written, I've read like he's written over 400 stories and I've read, maybe 150 of them and loved them. And I'm like, wow, there's 250 more out there. I would love to discover the rest of them. Okay. So I sent you, I mentioned, I sent you my, my rankings of the stories and we were pretty much in agreement with the major exception that I thought that the story Cordal to onion to carrot is one that I, I, I was like, Oh, why'd they include this one? I would have put something else in this place. And, and you said it's one of your favorite stories of all time. Yeah. So, um, so why don't you tell me why is this? Uh, I guess I'll just describe the the premise. So there's this mild mannered guy named Cordal, and he's always kind of being pushed around by more aggressive, uh, you know, alpha males. And he is driving somewhere and, and drops acid or something, and has an encounter with this ancient god who tells him, who explains to him that actually, like humanity's like a stew, and he's like an onion, and the obnoxious people are carrots. And you need them all to make a stew. And he kind of has this epiphany that he could be a carrot. And so he, he kind of goes around being obnoxious to people, uh, experimenting with that and, and really revels in the sense of power. And then um, toward the end of the story, uh, he's out to dinner with his wife or, or girlfriend, I forget. And um, it's just being incredible. There's a rude waiter. Uh, I, think, I guess I think they're in Paris. And, and he's incredibly rude back to the guy. And his uh, wife is is uh, scandalized and says, you can never do that again. He promises he won't. But then we find out in the coda to the story that uh, he, he goes off on different trips and, and <laughs> engages in his uh, obnoxious behavior. Yeah. Um, so, so, Tom, so why is that one of your favorite stories of all time? Well, why? Why? Uh, first of all, why? Why did, did you not think it was such a good story? I'm just curious. Um. I don't know. I guess like it's not science fiction, uh, really, uh, unless you count the the god as sort of fantasy. But um, I, I think uh, you know, I, I thought the ending was kind of weak. Like you know, like his wife just tells him not to do this, and he says okay, but then he's going to keep doing it anyway. It just it felt like kind of a letdown to me. Um, and um, yeah, I guess I don't know. There was nothing, and I didn't hate any of these stories. Um, uh, so I have, you know, I, I have a couple of them marked as so-so. I don't have any of them marked as terrible. But just when I think about other stories, other Shackley stories that I've read, like, you know, the Lifeboat Mutiny or something, um, those it seems like I would have swapped out one of those. Yeah, which, um, which by the way, I haven't read that in a long time, but the Lifeboat Mutiny story. But the uh, the list I just looked at online said that that's one of those AAA ACE interplanetary uh, decontamination service stories. Okay, cool. But um, but yeah. So why I like this story so much is um, I I like that it. Okay, I agree with you. It's not really science. I mean, you could just read this story and say this is about a guy who dropped acid, had an epiphany, and started being a jerk to people. Um, but I like that it 
it says that my favorite science fiction is stuff that actually could apply to your real life. And I feel like this story could, although I don't proselytize suddenly acting like a jerk to people. But I see this character as becoming sort of a, a he starts out as this nebbish who doesn't, you know, who just kowtows to anybody who tries to push him around. And then because of this, this experience he has, which he drops acid, but I like to think he really did somehow, you know, run into Hermes or Mercury and uh, the god Mercury and get this message from him, which which I I, lo- I just love the the aesthetic, the, the hippie kind of voice that he puts in there, because I know that comes directly from Sheckley's experience, people he hung out with probably when he was younger. And then I love that that this guy has this this epiphany that then affects his life that he then decides like I can I don't have to be I'm not bound by my vision of who I think I am. I could be anybody I want to be. And then he goes to to prove it and I love the way the story unfolds how there's so much hyperbole where he describes how like, you know, because he insults this guy who honks at him in traffic, uh he starts to talk back to this guy who honks at him in traffic and starts to call him out for it. You know, Russia almost invades Europe <laughs> because of that. And uh, there's all these big chunks of hyperbole that get piled onto the story to raise the stakes in sort of a fantasy sort of way. And I love that. And then I love how the guy experiments with this and really enjoys it, but then realizes like, I can't live my life like this because then I'm going to become what I beheld. I'm going to be one of these horrible people. And it's not his wife, by the way. It's a woman that they, his story problem at the beginning is that because he's this way, he can't ever have like a successful romantic relationship. And I might be projecting that a little bit, but I think that's basically what they say. He wants to have this, he wants so desperately to have a good relationship with a woman and, you know, settle down with her. And, and he doesn't, his dreams are not massive, but he has these dreams and he really, really wants them to come true but he can't make it come true because of who he is. And then when he has this revelation, he starts to try something different and it frees up this whole new world for him. But then he meets this woman who is just like perfect and would fit those dreams. And then he's going on, it's one of his first dates with her where they're actually, they're not at a restaurant and they're at this uh, mansion where they're going to look at these Byzantine miniatures. And this guy this butler who's going to let them in or not let them in just starts being horrible because he's not wearing a jacket and a tie. So he busts out his new persona and walks all over the guy and is horrible to the guy. Is absolutely You wouldn't want to act like this person, but he's absolutely horrible to this person. And um, and then she let me, let me just let me just say, Tom, I, I did like this line. Uh, I wrote it down during, during this exchange they're having this very acrimonious exchange. Uh, the butler, I guess it is, says, oh, wait, now I'm having trouble finding. Oh, he says, surely Monsieur does not want to spend his holiday in court. And the main character says, that is how Monsieur spends most of his holidays. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the, and the story is full of lines like that. Um, like, uh, I can't, I'm not going to be able to remember. And full of great characterizations. Like he says, there's one waiter who looks exactly like Jean pa- Jean-Claude Belmondo, who I had to look up. It was apparently some kind of old French actor. And but I but I love that line. I love so many lines. There's so many great lines in the story like that one you just you just read. Um, But then he ends up, you know, getting in the the butler, like lets him in and he gets what he wants. But then this woman who he really is falling for says, you know, I'm done with you. You're horrible. I will never. We're done. He's like, no, no, let me explain. She's like, you can explain, but not to me ever. I mean it. Leave me alone. And then he realizes like that she is without, without uh, fail. She's, she's for, forever an onion. She's a small, mild, pearly white onion like he is. And he's lost her because he was playing around with this fire. And then he, you know, weeks go by and he, he manages to win her back. But he promises that was a psychotic episode. And it will never happen again. <laughs> but he does, you know, from time once a year or something, go off on a solitary vacation and, and, just to kind of vent, which which I see him then as sort of like a Dexter, but he doesn't kill serial killers. He just is rude to rude people. And and for that, I love the story. I just think it's an absolutely brilliant story. And I, and I actually, one of the reasons I like it so much is because I showed it to a friend of mine who doesn't like science fiction. I had it, I was like, you got to read this story. And he read it. And he is sort of, he went, this friend of mine went through a very similar transformation to that in his life. And, um, 
And he absolutely loved the story. And maybe because it reminds me of my friend so much, I like the story so much because I, I watched my friend go through this same thing, uh, this same story almost. But so maybe that, maybe that, you know, colored my response to it. Hmm. I mean, it's making me think of there's this Star Trek episode where there's this transporter accident and Kirk gets split into good Kirk and evil Kirk. And the good Kirk is completely ineffectual. And, um, you know, and it, it, it's sort of like Kirk needs his evil side to be the, you know, the person that we that we know and love. And so I don't know, it seems like there's some, maybe something of that going on here that, you know, you have yeah. to ha- have that rudeness inside you, even if you keep it under control in order to not get a just get walked all over him. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think so too. I think that's a very apt comparison. And I, and I also, you know, it's no coincidence that Sheckley did write at least one episode of Deep Space Nine. And I think, I, I'm not sure, I don't think he wrote any of the original series, but it wouldn't shock me. Um, I haven't really, I think I did look into it once and I don't think he did, but, uh, but yeah, the, the Star Trek reference with the evil Kirk and, and, you know, the fact that the original Cordal as an onion is, sort of ineffectual, at least in some areas of his life. But then uh, once he learns how to be evil, it starts to wreck things. And then he's like, okay, no, I need to merge these and and understand that they both have a place, but I need to keep them under control. Yeah. So maybe if, uh, maybe I'll go back and read it again. See, uh, see if it grows on me at all. It may. Um, All right, let's see. So, um, in your um, afterward to Dimensions of Sheckley, you said that at the time that Sheckley was enjoying a Spinal Tap type renaissance. What did you mean by that? He was being um, being discovered. I'm, I'm going to have to try to remember myself because that was 2003 when I wrote that afterward, I think. But I, I'm pretty sure he was undergoing this kind of... Uh, second English as a second or not even English as a second language, but a translational, uh, if that's a word for it, uh, renaissance of his work in other countries, in, in, you know, Russia, in, uh, Italy, in all throughout Europe, in, in Asia, just all over, uh, I guess, I guess I meant to say China. Um, but all over the world, outside of the U S he was undergoing this renaissance of his work, which I think is now starting to happen here. Maybe I'm starting to feel like it is, which, you know, more power to him. He, if anybody deserves it, it's him. He's just brilliant. But, um, but no, back then he was telling me, look, I'm, you know, I'm traveling to Venice. Um, it's vacation, but I'm going to be talking about my stories. I'm being interviewed by this person over in Italy. I'm, I'm traveling to Russia to, on a, on a book tour. I'm, traveling to this place, you know, these, these, all these different countries were suddenly saying, Hey, this guy is great. We're rediscovering him and he's still alive. Let's have him over here and talk to us and interview him. And, uh, and he was loving it. You know, I think he was eating it up. He was just like, this is so nice. I, I didn't expect this to happen, but it's fun. And yeah, that was, that was happening for him. And I, I was really happy that it was happening. Yeah, you know, they're on. If you go on YouTube, there's an Italian science fiction author named Roberto Qualia, and he, I, I think he traveled around with Sheckley um, a lot of, during this period, and and he's interviewed him a bunch of times, and also has has videos of other people uh, in Italy interviewing him. So, um, yeah, he was, um, you know, getting getting attention, um, you know, outside the U.S. What is what is your sense, Tom, of how well known he was or is? in in the u.s because i mean i i would have said that he was largely forgotten um but this book um that we've been talking about the uh the store of the world has like 95 reviews on goodreads which kind of surprised me so maybe he's better better known than i than i sort of uh, thought he was i i think he was largely forgotten i think he really was i think um you know when i when i discovered him i certainly was very into science fiction but i was very into old old style, old school science fiction, because I think just because I would go into um, bookstores and look for used books, and a lot of them were from the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, and I would say, oh, I'm going to buy this and read this. Um, so, I, And when I discovered him, I was like, wow, wow, I had no idea this guy was out there, and he's so good, and he's not just so good once, which there, there were so many writers from that time period where I'd find one story by them that I was like, I absolutely love this story. Um, 
I'm trying to think of it. I'll never think of this guy's name, but he was, I actually spoke to him at, in Con Jose one year. I think it was William 10, but he wrote this, which that's a pseudonym, but he wrote this story about uh, this, this, this future earth where this, the only thing I can remember about it off the top of my head is this man meets this woman who he instantly falls in love with at first sight. And he says, will you marry me? And her answer is Wednesday. And, uh, which I thought was so funny. And, and the whole story is so funny. And that was like a Sheckley story. And then there are so many writers who wrote one story like that, but then to discover Sheckley and find that he had written so many blew me away that he just like made a career of it and that he made a career of it in magazines and never really broke into the, into being a successful novelist. And then, yeah, I think he was largely forgotten, but I do think he's undergoing a bit of a renaissance. And I hope this podcast helps. I hope people discover him and, and uh, read his work. Maybe 400 people will buy this book now. <laughs> Hopefully more. Um, earlier, you mentioned drugs. I feel like, I don't know, did, you read the um, Sheckley's autobiography, right? On his, from Dimensions of Sheckley? I did but i i'll be honest i don't really remember much of it um but i do you were gonna mention what did, what did you see in there about drugs well so i mean the way i read it was basically that he you know he had all this six early success as a writer in the 50s when he was living in new york city and there's actually kind of an interesting story about how um you know most of the stories he sold to horace gold who was editing galaxy magazine and um uh, Sheckley was living in the West Village, and he would just go over to H Horace Gold's apartment, who who lived in um, Stuyvesant Town, uh, sort of on the east side of Manhattan, and um, and knock on the door. And I think Horace Gold was a, um, a what do you call it? He had a, a agoraphobic, and would often just not, not answer the door. And so Sheckley would slip the story under the door and go home. And oftentimes, by the time he got home. Uh, Horace Gold had already read the story and was calling him to to tell him that he wanted to buy it. Um, but so, but so anyway, so he had this whole life in New York and lots of friends in the West Village and everything. And it seems like once he got out of the West Village, that's when things kind of started to go wrong for him, and that he ended up. Um, you know, he he lived in Ibiza for for a time, which is a an island off the coast of Spain, and he just loved it there with the weather and the the beach, and you know it was cheap and everything, but. I think around that time he started getting into all sorts of drugs and at least the way I read his autobiography is that, um, you know, that probably wasn't the best thing for his writing. Yeah. I do remember that of the Horace Gold story. I don't remember him overtly talking about drugs, but now you make me really want to go back and reread that because I've been thinking about him a lot lately. And, um, and I, I do, I do think, yeah, that that's what happened. I think, you know, he had this, even before he was a science fiction writer, he had this love of adventure and excitement and trying to figure out what's out there. And, um, and he, he wrote those stories because that's what he wanted. He wanted to get out. He didn't want to live in, you know, Northeastern, Northeastern New Jersey in a suburb. He wanted to see what everything was all about and really dig his teeth into life and live. And I think he admired, you know, Hemingway and, Gertrude Stein and, and, you know, that whole sort of movement. And I think he wanted to be, be part of that. I think he probably grew up reading about that and was like, this is where I want to live my life. And I think he went out and did that. You know, I think he, he did. And once he started actually living that life and then, like you said, getting more into drugs and the, the drugs do come across in his stories. You, you get a lot of drug references. Um, but I think, yeah, once he started getting into the drugs, I think it made it harder and maybe also, you know, and I'll qualify that. I don't remember him. I don't remember that f of him talking about doing drugs at all ever. Um, but if he did get into drugs and if that is in that biography, which I'm going to reread, um, yeah, certainly that would hurt him. But I wonder if also just living his dreams maybe hurt it too, because now instead of having to dream about it and write about it, he was just living it. He was living in Ibiza. He moved to Portland, Oregon. He went and, you know, went to Venice. He went all over Europe. He did all live, didn't just go on like a vacation. He lived in places like that and he, and he lived his dreams. And I wonder if that co sort of took away his need to, to dream as much. I, I'm, I, I'm suspect it's the drugs, but. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. That was a really interesting, uh, 
Uh, yeah, whether or not it's true, it was a really sort of interesting observation. But yeah, because I am always just, I don't know, I just want to mention that because, I don't know, I, I think there is this sort of like romanticization of, of alcohol and drugs when it comes to writers. And, uh, yeah. you know, it just seems like a lot of times, you know, like so many writers, they actually decline and, you know, and it kind of screws up their writing rather than, you know, yeah. rather than inspiring them. Yeah, that is such an unfortunate I don't know where that stereotype came about, but it's so unfortunate because it's so not true that, you know, you have to, you have to experience pain before you can write. Don't worry. Life will give you plenty of pain. You don't need to go out and seek it through a bottle. But I I thought that when I was a kid, I was like, I I remember buying like bottles of scotch and being like, I'm a writer. I got to have a bottle of scotch (laughs) in my apartment. And then thank God I stopped you know, I got away from it. And and now that I'm older and I know some successful writers and successful authors, they don't do that. That's not what they do. It's the ones, people like Chandler, you know, he famously, he was, uh, in, I believe he was an alcoholic, but he, um, he had a lot of problems. And I think they took away from his native genius and talent. I think as he goes on, you can see him deteriorating. And that happens to a lot of writers where they get into that. And it's the ones who are just disciplined and who you know, understand that that stereotype is just a stereotype who I think really end up making it. Yeah. I also wanted to, I mean, this, um, this book has a a cover blurb from Roger Zelazny. And I know that Zelazny collaborated on three novels with Robert Sheckley. I don't know if you've ever, did you ever read, read any of those? I think I did. What refresh my memory? What are the names? Bring me the head of Prince Charming. If at Faust, you don't succeed and a farce to be reckoned with. I did. I did read at least one of those. And I think I felt like it was a little too like just trying to be all humor instead of uh, having that Sheckley kind of emotion at the bottom of it. But I love Zelazny too. So I, I don't know. What was your sense of those? Did you read those? Oh, I've, I haven't read them. No, I mean, my my sense having not read them is that they're not very good. But that's just I don't know. Nobody ever I never hear hear anybody talking about them or anything. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I think I think I was like, oh, I love Zelazny and I love Sheckley. I'm going to read this and it's going to be brilliant. And I think I read at least one of them, and I think I thought, well, now this is. They obviously said let's write a comedy, but I, I think Sheckley's best stuff started out as like him just trying to write something, and then it wound up funny um, because that's who he was. But yeah, yeah, it's funny though. It's strange that Zelazny's such a brilliant writer, and and I think they were friends too. I think. They were, um, you know, close friends and they're very similar. Their stuff is very similar in a lot of ways. Yeah. Well, it's just interesting that, you know, Robert, she- you know, like, like you and I, like Robert Sheckley, Roger Zelazny, Douglas Adams, we all kind of, we kind of gravitate to a lot of the same authors. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're, they're all very similar aesthetics. And then we, we give, it, he's not science fiction, but we give short shrift to Terry Pratchett, who I think took that genius and turned it into a franchise like what a brilliant man to be able to do that over so many novels it's the same voice it's the same you know douglas adams robert sheckley and some some books uh rogers lasney voice but just done with a formula that just works over and over and over again like i i I always am happy for him that he he figured it out you know he figured out how do i turn this into something that i can just do and People will pay me for it and it will just work every time. Yeah. But so one thing I wanted to mention, I don't know if you noticed this, but so um, this the title story in here, uh, Store of the Worlds, came out in 1959, which is about 10 years before the first Amber book, Nine Princes in Amber, 1970. Mm. And so this is a quote from Store of the Worlds. Worlds without end, emanating from events large and small, doesn't every object cast a shadow? Well, my friend, the earth itself is four-dimensional. Therefore, it casts three-dimensional shadows, solid reflections of itself through every moment of its being, millions, billions of earths, an infinity of earths, and your minds, uh, liberated by me, will be able to select any of these worlds and to live upon it for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I just have to wonder if Roger Zelazny, either consciously or subconsciously, you know, had that in mind when he came up with the idea for Amber, because it just, just the, um, you know, the idea of an infinite number of earths of earth casting shadows that, you know, you pick and you pick the one you want, you know, I think the original title of the story was something like, uh, worlds of desire, worlds of your desire or something. 
um, which which again sounds like something from Amber. So I don't know. I don't have any inside knowledge there. But if anyone knows whether that influenced Roger Zelazny at all, uh, I'd be curious to know that. Yeah, I think that having read a lot of old time science fiction, I think that alternate Earths was a pretty even in 1959 was a pretty well worn idea. Maybe not though. Maybe it was like in the '60s when that. Maybe he was the first. Sheckley was the first one to bring it up. But I do think. Um, oh, I do think. The, well, no, well, no, no. It's definitely, definitely not the idea of like multiple of parallel worlds. That was definitely a familiar concept. I mean, I don't. I'd have to check the year. But I mean, there was this series I've heard about, never read, by Fletcher Pratt called "The Complete Enchanter," where every in every story, these these characters ended up on some. Um, parallel worlds where the laws of physics were different and they had to figure out how to like how to get off it or something or you know work work in that environment so no but it's just the idea of the like infinite earths where you pick the one you want and the the idea of like one earth casting shadows of itself and just the the word shadows i agree like, just those things together yeah that's really really sounds like amber to me i completely agree with that yeah i was gonna say it's it's not so much the idea but the way he describes it there very much sounds like amber and I, I thought that as i read it and then as you read it back to me um yeah it sounds so much like amber just just the wording of it and the aesthetic of it yeah uh, so i don't know if anyone has any information about that let me know um yeah we're pretty much out of time just trying to think uh what do you think about free jack yeah that one um was not a great book and was not a great movie. Um, what was that? Immortality Inc. was the book. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. And then they turned it into the movie with Emilio Estevez, Free Jack. Yeah. Yeah, I was so excited when that, because I think that came out around the time I was really getting into Sheckley in my mid 20s. And I think I, um, you know, I think I, I went and found that and I was like, oh, so cool. It's a Sheckley movie. And I watched it and was just like, no, 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 no. And there were a few of his, <laughs> few of his lines got through from the book. A few of his good lines got from, through from the book into the movie. And I was like, hey, hooray, there's Sheckley. But the movie itself <laughs> is just, they just completely changed everything to make it more action movie-ish. And it didn't work. And uh, and the book itself is, you know, is good in terms of like, there's some fun Sheckley stuff in it, but the whole book doesn't seem to hang together. And the same thing with... He's got another one that I really like some parts of. I love some parts of this book called A Game of X, um, which is a novel about a spy. He wrote a lot of other stuff too, you know, besides science fiction. He wrote like spy novels and uh, I think he wrote like a Western or something. He, I'm not sure about that, but he wrote in lots of different genres. Science fiction was his favorite. But um, yeah, there were lots of novels. I, I do encourage people though to go check out uh, the Status Civilization, which is just a really cool piece of not funny at all social commentary, really fun piece of old time science fiction that should be as famous as Fahrenheit 451, I feel like, and it's not. And then um, I think it's called Zlotl too, but I, I apologize if I got that wrong. I didn't actually go look it up. It's anyway, it's one about a about basically a space tick that comes back and tries to take over the world and almost succeeds. And in a very, um, like I said earlier, it's sort of the thing sort of setting um, with a bunch of people and characters just like that. And it, it's a really gripping book. It's really kind of freaky. So uh, those are good too. Yeah. Just some, some other trivia. Um, I just know this from Wikipedia, but it said that in Immortality Inc, there's a part where the character's in the future and he uh, gets in line not realizing that it's a line for a suicide booth, like a public suicide booth. And yeah. so they, they use that in the first episode of Futurama. So that's kind of what that was a reference to. Interesting. And actually this book, Dimension of Miracles, that possibly inspired Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, there's an audio book out read by John Hodgman. So that sounds pretty cool. So. Oh, cool. I'll look that up. And also there's a, you just made me think of um, Mind Swap is another novel of his that's that's very it's it's very good. There's some stuff about it that is a little bit you know sketch comedy ish, but but it's also very good in a lot of ways. It's not his best novel, but it's right up there and, it, and it's humor. And it's about this guy who can swap. He can travel by swapping your mind to an, another body in a, on a different planet. But then uh, customs or the you know the TSA or whatever misplaces his body, so he he has to go like swap from body to body to body 
for, across all different worlds into these like renter bodies that he can't stay in and looking for the on the hunt of the person who stole his body um and then uh and then there, there's this line near the end where he meets this might actually be dimension of miracles now i think of it he meets his uh he meets his uncle his long lost uncle who tells him uh yeah, I don't know. I fell into this wormhole uh, outside the the public golf course in like Hoboken and uh, or it's not Hoboken, but some small town in New Jersey. And he's like, you know, the the Greens Committee really ought to like put up a sign or a small enclosing <laughs> structure or something. And that and and he finds his uncle through this theory that if you just sit still, like if you if you try to look for someone when someone is lost, you'll never find them because they're looking for you. But if you just sit still you'll find him. So he sits still and he finds like six or seven people that have been lost throughout his life, just wander into this alien <laughs> planet. And it, it's such a brilliant, <laughs> such a brilliant scene and such a brilliant line. But uh, that's, that's one worth checking out as well. Yeah. I'll also just mention that in this, this intro, Lethem and Zabramovich, they, they make the point that, uh, that Shekley really paved the way for, for later writers like Philip K. Dick, Harlan Ellison and J.G. Ballard. And that's definitely the case with Philip K. Dick. I mean, these, yeah. these stories are, are very, very similar to Philip K. Dick. I mean, often a little, um, you know, significantly more polished. Um, but if you like Philip K. Dick, um, you should definitely check out Robert Sheckley because, uh, you know, they are pretty similar. Very much so. I went the other way around where I discovered Philip K. Dick afterward and absolutely loved him and thought, wow, he's a lot like Sheckley. <laughs> um, all right, cool. Yes, yeah, so we are. We're totally out of time. So we need to start wrapping this up. Uh, everyone go out and buy store of the worlds so that let's let's see if we can get 500 copies yeah <laughs> oh wait and also like yeah don't forget to buy tom's uh intergalactic refrigerator repairman seldom carry cash we are still paying attention to every sale and appreciate them all very very much thank you um all right cool so our guest today has been tom garenser and again we've been speaking with him about the book store of the worlds the stories of robert sheckley so, Tom, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to Tom Gerenser for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.